to look at how we can predict the direction of equilibrium as well as the impact on equilibrium if we change certain factors. So up until now we've been taking a look at uh, examples where we are already at equilibrium and we have sometimes figured out the concentrations that exist at equilibrium or calculated a KEQ. If we are at a certain point in time and we want to figure out if we are at equilibrium or not, we can use something called the reaction quotient or QEQ. And that's calculated in the exact same way that an equilibrium expression is. So given a general equation, my QEQ is equal to concentration of products over concentration of reactants and my coefficients are what become the exponents in that. So we can use those to calculate the concentrations to calculate the QEQ, -E sorry, and then we can determine if we're at equilibrium. So what we do is if QEQ -E and KEQ are the same, then I am at equilibrium. So that means that my concentrations give me the right ratio between products and reactants, which is what KEQ -E is. If QEQ -E is smaller than my equilibrium expression, so equilibrium is products over reactants, And so if my current concentration ratio is less than the equilibrium expression, then to get a larger number, so to get to KEQ, the top number would need to get bigger, which means that equilibrium needs to move towards the right or towards the products. And then the converse is true. If KEQ is larger, in that case, I need that number or the denominator to get larger to get the overall ratio to KEQ. And so in that case, my equilibrium is going to shift towards the reactants or to the left to reach equilibrium. So an example, at a certain temperature, KEQ is 55 and the reaction vessel contains a mixture of SO3 concentration equaling 0.85 molar nitrogen monoxide equals 1.2 molar SO2 equals 1.5 molar and NO2 equals 2 molar so is that at equilibrium and if not which way does the reaction have to proceed to reach equilibrium so there's all the important pieces of information so I'm going to solve for my QEQ so that's equal to concentration of products and all my coefficients are one so all of my exponents are one and I'm just going to plug in all of the values I'm given so SO2 is equal to 1.5 molar NO2 is equal to 2 molar SO3 is 0.85 and NO is 1.2 and as I multiply that my QEQ is equal to 2.94 and KEQ is equal to 55 so I need my number to be bigger to be at equilibrium. So this is what happens at equilibrium, whereas this is given the current concentrations that are given to me. So to get to equilibrium, my number needs to get bigger, which means that my numerator needs to increase in concentration, and that is my products. So that means that this is not at equilibrium because QEQ is not equal to KEQ and I need to shift to the right or towards the products in order to reach equilibrium here. Okay, and the next thing we're gonna take a look at is what happens if um, different factors are changed in an equilibrium, what happens to the equilibrium. 
in that situation. So we have talked about the fact that uh, the equilibrium constant we have KEQ is for a specific temperature. So for any reaction, as I change the temperature, the KEQ value changes. So we're going to take a look at what happens now then as some of the conditions change. So Le Chatelier's principle is going to help us figure out what happens to the reaction. And that is just that if a system at equilibrium is subjected to an external stress, the equilibrium is going to shift to minimize that stress. So because equilibrium is a balance between the forward and reverse reactions, any sort of differences, any changes, whether it's in temperature or something else can affect that system. And so those are the stresses that were referred to in Le Chatelier's principle. And we are going to take a look at changes in concentration of reactants or products, uh, the temperature, and then also pressure or volume. So if I change the concentration, I can do that by either increasing or decreasing concentration of a reactant or a product. So that means four different things can happen. I can increase my concentration of reactants, I can decrease my concentration of reactants, or I can increase my concentration of products or decrease my concentration of products. So taking reactants out of the system would cause the system to try to replace that by shifting towards the left and making more reactants. So the reverse reaction is going to happen there. If I remove products, then the system is going to shift to the right to replace the product that is lost. And if I increase my concentration of reactants, now I'm going to shift away to counteract the addition of reactant. So this time I'm going to shift towards products. And if I increase concentration of products, then I'm going to shift away from that to the left towards reactants to counteract that change. So as an example, Haber process here, so nitrogen and hydrogen combining to make ammonia. So what would be the effect if we add more ammonia? So if I'm adding more of my product, I'm going to shift away towards my reactants to counteract that change. If I add more nitrogen, this time I am increasing the concentration of my reactant, so I want to shift away from that to counteract that. So I'm going to shift to the right or towards the products. And if I remove hydrogen, this time I am decreasing the concentration of my reactant, so I want to replace what I decreased or took away. So I'm going to shift towards the left to make more reactant to try to replace that hydrogen that was removed. Okay, another condition, changing temperature. So this is going to be dependent on whether something is exothermic or endothermic. So exothermic is when we have heat being produced, so it's one of the products. So if we increase the temperature, then we can see that that is showing up in the product side. So it's similar to concentration in terms of an idea. If I increase temperature, then it's like adding product. So to counteract that, then my reaction is going to shift towards the reactants to remove the heat that was added. If, on the other hand, I lower the temperature, then that is the same as removing some heat. And so in this case, I'm actually going to shift towards the products to the right to try to replace some of that heat. So temperature ends up working out similar to concentration in terms of thinking about which direction our equilibrium is going to shift and why. So the opposite is going to be true for endothermic since heat shows up in the reactants there. So if I increase the temperature, that's like adding more of a reactant. So then I'm going to shift away from that addition to counteract, moving towards the products. And if I lower the temperature, then that's the same as taking away some of my reactant. So I'm going to want to replace that by moving towards the reactants or shifting towards the left. And the oh, example, so A plus B becomes 2C. 
and delta H is positive 40 kilojoules. So remember the positive, that means that it is endothermic, which means that heat is going to be on the reactant side of the equation. So if heat is removed, so if I'm taking away something from reactants, then I'm going to want to replace it, which means I'm going to shift to the left or towards the reactants. And if I add heat, then I'm adding reactant since it's endothermic, which means I'm gonna shift away to counteract that. So that's going to shift towards the right. Okay, and the last set of conditions are if we change the pressure or the volume. So that is only when we have uh, gaseous equilibria since liquids and solids aren't affected by changes in pressure or volume. So if I decrease my volume or increase my pressure, so those two work hand in hand. So as I decrease the space that something has, then there's an increase in pressure. And that is going to end up moving towards the side that has less molecules in total. So there's going to be less space, which means we want to have less molecules. And then if I increase the volume or decrease the pressure, the reverse is going to happen. In this case, I'm going to move towards whichever side of the equation has more molecules. If the two sides of the equation have an equal number of molecules, then a change in pressure or temperature, or sorry, pressure or volume is going to have no impact on that equilibrium. So there's going to be no changes happening there. And if there's an inert gas that gets added at constant volumes, there will be a shift in the pressure because of the additional molecules, but that will not impact the equilibrium. So that's only though if it's an inert gas. Okay, so for each of these, if the pressure increases, and there's a decrease in volume, what is going to happen to the system? So I have 2SO2 plus O2 becoming 2O3. So on the reactant side, I have two, three total molecules and two on the products. So three for reactants, two for products. So if I'm increasing the pressure or decreasing the volume, so I have less space, that means I'm going to want to move towards whichever side has less molecules, so in this case towards the products or to the right. H2 plus I2 becomes 2HI, so I have 1, 2, and 2. So here, because I have the same number on both sides, there's going to be no difference. And CaCO3 becoming CaO and CO2, so I have one molecule on my reactants and one, 2, on my product side. So once again, I'm looking for the side that has less, which in this case is my reactants. So moving towards the left or towards the reactants. And practice questions. So for KQEQ are on page 461, numbers 81 to 84. And Le Chatelier's principle is page 39, numbers 21 to 23 and 26.